Pythagoras and Phidias, what I call harmony in numbers sequences. Are you ready? Let's start. Pythagoras was born circa 570 and died circa 495 before the Common Era. And let's talk about his theorem. It begins with a right triangle, which means a triangle that has one 90 degree angle. Let's say that side A has four units in length, side B three units in length, and that leaves size side C with five units in length. The theorem calls for squaring these sides, so let's go ahead and square side A. That means we make a square that's four by four. We do the same with B, three by three, and with C, five by five. So now you all knew that four by four gives us 16 units, three by three, nine, and five by five, 25. So what is the theorem? The theorem basically states that in the conditions of every right triangle, the squaring of side C will always be the sum of sides, squaring of side A and the squaring of side B. And that's why I put it in color so you can actually see that indeed the 25 units of side C square contain the 16 units plus the 9 units of squaring the other two sides. What is Pythagoras theorem used for? Well, in old times it was used for calculating taxes in different terrains when the land was not distributed exactly the same way and there were some angles that could be used. It is used basically for calculating distances. And one example that I thought was really neat is in this webpage, Saving the Whales. This is being used now for sonar and it's actually saving whales. So it's neat. And I thought it was a good example of Pythagoras can be used not only to build things, but also to find things and basically measure in distances. Pythagoras theorem, besides calculating distances, is very useful for building. We, you know, I did put there like the typical house with a triangular shape on the roof. As long as you have, remember, a right triangle, then you can calculate areas and you can actually make your estimates for how much you need in terms of materials. This is a very nice example from a Russian architect where he is taking the Pythagorean theorem in architecture to the 21st century. I thought it was neat. Applying Pythagoras theorem to everyday life, my sister was recently working on creating a column for bathroom that she's renovating. I poorly drew the image where you see sort of the roof and then the corner, and then that's where she is building a column. And because she is building the column right in the corner, there is a 90 degree angle because her walls in the bathroom happen to be 90 degree angle. So that's where she wants to build the column. She did send me this picture of her calculations she knew the, let's say, side C in her triangle. And she did not know exactly how the sides A and B, which are the same side in this case, um, she did not know exactly how long they should be. So just in case you cannot read her handwriting from this picture, she did send it to me in a better way where she easily calculated how much she needed to do her column. I probably should say that she is an applied mathematician and she does use algorithms in her everyday life, even for cooking. But anyway, this was a very nice example of her using Pythagoras to make a calculation of how much material she needs and the actual length of the different elements in her column. We are probably all acquainted with the Greek alphabet. This is a very nice pottery that has one of the oldest complete alphabets. Uh, the photo is from Wikipedia, but it's in the Greek Museum in Athens. 
and I found this really nice is the first written ex excerpt from the Odyssey. And of course, there's Greek letters in there. Uh, we cannot see them very well, but they are there. So we all know that they used an alphabet and they used letters. But the Greeks, great mathematicians in classic uh, world, did not actually have numbers. A system of numbers was introduced by the Romans where they had different, they still use letters. So they had like for the first order in the thousands, they used the letter M. For the hundreds, the letter C. For the tens, the letter X. And for the units, the letter I. And as you go down in the different orders, you just add another letter. When you get to the fifth order, they introduced a new letter. D for hundreds, L for tens, and V for the units. So five units in the letter V means that V is five. And when you go to the previous order before five, what you do is you add the unit of five and you put a unit of one before it and that gives you four. You do the same for the tens. L is 50 and X is 10. So 50 minus 10 is 40. And then the D is 500 and the C, remember, was 100. So 500 minus 100 gives you four. If we continue with the Roman way of numbering, because it's a decimal system, when they get to number nine, now they do not need to introduce a new letter because that is already used. And having a system of numbering at least allow them some better calculations. And it's probably one of the many reasons why they were known as being great architects and engineers. So how can the calculations be done for constructing or building different things using the Pythagoras theorem and measuring the different sides in knowing that the Greek alphabet contains letters but not numbers. How could they be so accurate? Well, this is one of the explanations that I have read. You just grab a rope and grab a stick. Now I drew the stick. Uh, this is a pencil drawing. Uh, with uh, what seems to be like a pointy end on the left so you can actually stick it on the ground and I'll walk you through how you can without having numbers create a perfect Pythag Pythagoras progression. First you start with a square and that square you can measure with the length of your rope. You just make sure that you know all the sides are going to be the same and you walk from one and to another, that way you have your square. Within the square, of course, there's two right, well, there's four right triangles. So let's take a look at the first one. What you're gonna do is stick that um, piece of wood that I gave you on the left bottom corner of the square, and you're gonna tie the rope to it. The next thing you do is that you're gonna walk towards the diagonal to the right top corner. And that is your side C of your right triangle. Now you take that rope stretched as it is. You, you know that's the size of side C and just walk to the left. And you actually get to the side where you started and now you build a rectangle there. You do the same. Keep the stick on the ground in the same corner. Now you stretch the rope to the new diagonal, which is your new side C. You walk to the left and now you build the next rectangle. These are rectangular progressions using the Pythagorean theorem and exactly following the Pythagorean ratio.
it was used a lot in the old times. Some examples that actually are found in medieval times, perfect example is in La Alhambra in Granada in Spain, almost all the arches and doors follow this Pythagoras theorem in the ratio of Pythagoras. And even that door that you see on the right, the brown door, I'm going to bring it to the front and you see that even that door is also with the same ratio. So Pythagoras is actually found in a lot of the architecture from the Arabs. And it is a very pleasing proportion that people used in buildings. The golden ratio is known with the letter phi, the Greek letter phi, in honor of Phidias, who lived circa 480 to 430 before the Common Era. He was a Greek architect and sculptor, and he was said to use these proportions. So what is the golden ratio? Basically, when we have two lines of different length A and B, the sum of A plus B divided by the longer length A equals the longer length A divided by the shorter length B. In other words, A plus B is to A, the same as A is to B. So the proportion that these two lines have and the relationship between these two lines and the addition of the two lines is a ratio that no matter what the length of these lines is always the same number. And this number is 1.618. Uh, you can read the rest. You can try it. You can use different lengths as long as the condition of the ratio is met, you will see that the ratio is always the same number. To create a golden rectangle, what we do is we use a square that has the length of A and we add a rectangle by the side that has one side, the smaller side is gonna be the length of B, which was in the golden ratio compared to A. And then, of course, to complete the rectangle, the other two sides are the length of A. This is a golden rectangle. When we looked at Pythagoras before and we saw the progression of rectangles in Pythagorean ratio, we saw the beauty of it. It's a constant whenever you have a right triangle. And you know, you could question well, is the Pythagorean theorem or the Pythagorean progression or triangle, does it have the golden ratio? Well, let's look at the example we had before. So if we use the calculation, C divided by B is 1.666, so it's not the golden ratio. And the other condition should be met. C plus B divided by C should be the same as C divided by B. And that's not the case. It's close, but it's not the case. So let's look at the other side. It would be C divided by A. Well, that's really way off the golden ratio. And furthermore, when we use the other condition, it's really very far from the golden ratio. So Pythagoras ratio is different from the golden ratio. It is used also in architecture, but there are two different concepts. Using the golden ratio, remember that's a constant number. Let's create a golden spiral. We begin using a series of golden rectangles. So we first start with a square that has the length of A, and we place that square in the page. Then we have to build the rectangle B. Remember that has one side is the length of A, and the other one is the length of B, which is the one that creates the golden ratio compared to A. So we place that rectangle. Now we have a golden rectangle, and what we do is we build the next rectangle based on the square that has now the length of the sides A and B. <coughs> As you can see in this figure, now that's the square. And then we put the rectangle 
And if you realize what we did here was to also, every time we build a new rectangle, we are turning it progressively with a 90 degree counterclock. So when you start doing this, you will create the golden spiral. Basically, if you can take a look, I'll give you a little bit of time, you can take a look, and each one of these golden rectangles has been the basis for creating the golden spiral. So how could the Greeks, especially Phidias, who used this ratio in his sculptures, could make these calculations when they had an alphabet they had letters, but they didn't have numbers. So how could they accurately calculate this number? And especially Phidias was well known for his sculptures. And none of them remain. We don't have any original Phidias, but there were a lot of copies made by uh, the Greeks and, and Romans, especially in later times. So how could he do that? Let's take a look at the golden rectangle. And these are two copies. Uh, one of them is in the Vatican. And this, uh, the one on the left is uh, one Amazon that's wounded. It's the wounded Amazon. And the one on the right, there's many, many copies of it. This is the one, the picture from Wikipedia. And it's uh, the goddess Athena, uh, which was in the Parthenon. So how did he use the golden ratio? He built his rectangles, and you can actually see that the proportions of his statues follow the golden rectangle. Other than the golden rectangle, there are other figures, as we saw the golden spiral. But I want to take a little time in explaining uh, a something interesting about the progression in the golden spiral. So we saw how the golden spiral is produced. And let me show you now an interesting thing. Focus on this square. So the golden spiral is created by golden rectangles, but if you, you actually just pay attention to the squares within each rectangle, and we look at the area, what we see is a progression where the first rectangle is going to be one by one, the next one is going to be two by two, the next one is three by three, the next one is five by five. We can see it better in this particular image where I took away the spiral. And this progression, if you start in the middle and you go up and then left and counterclock, will give you a progression of numbers. And this can continue. You can continue making these rectangles, flipping them 90 degrees counterclock, and you can continue almost, I think, to infinity. So if you have not read the Da Vinci Code or you haven't seen this particular progression before, you may not know this is called the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci did not actually dis discover it. He learned about it in his travels to the Middle East as a crusader. Um, and, but he wrote about it in his Liberabaci, uh, published in 1202. And that's how he introduced this sequence of numbers to the Western world. In addition to the golden spiral and the golden rectangle, there's a golden triangle that would actually have Two of the sides would be the same, and the smaller one will be in proportion in the golden ratio with the other two sides. So that the, the two sides that are equal, it's an isosceles triangle, will have the same ratio compared to the other side. Now, I just wanted to let you know that there's one particular case where the right triangle meets the golden ratio, and that's called a Kepler triangle. So it is possible that sometimes the Pythagoras ratio in a particular right triangle could also meet the golden ratio, but in other cases, as we saw before, the golden ratio is not generally met 
in a right triangle. Only when you find this special right triangle, which is called the Kepler triangle. Let's talk about the other Leonardo. Leonardo Bonacci was born in 1170 and died in 1250 of the Common Era. He's better known as Fibonacci. He was an Italian mathematician that some consider to be the most talented Western mathematician of the Middle Ages. So he's better known for the Fibonacci sequence of numbers, and that has actually a progression in the golden ratio. This had been already described and used by Indian mathematicians from the 6th century. And he probably had contact with this system of the numeral system from the Hindu Arabic world when he went in the Crusades. He brought it back to Europe and he published the numbers in Liberabaci, his publication of 1202. And that's how he made the Fibonacci numbers or the Fibonacci sequence known to the Western world. This is taken from my sister's notes on her teaching materials of the Fibonacci numbers. So when we take a look at the golden ratio, the golden rectangle, and we know now that the progression follows the Fibonacci series, let me give you some examples of how it's been used. So. In architecture, it is well known that the Romans did follow this particular proportion. And this ratio is seen in a lot of their constructions. This is a very interesting paper by John Gurry from the University of Chicago, and it's available in, in the website, where he does have several examples. And you can see that in all of these cases, he has measured the golden rectangle with the sides A and B following the golden ratio. It probably is not very um, um, astonishing or surprising that in the Middle Ages now we have Santa Maria Novella di Firenze in Italia, built by Leon Battista Alberti in the 15th century. It does follow a lot of the Fibonacci or golden ratio, but remember Fibonacci introduced this ratio in 1202. Um, the Romans actually were using it before they knew about this sequence of numbers. But in architecture, it has been used a lot. And as I mentioned before, it was mentioned to be the divine ratio. Again, not very surprising that architecture has used it a lot, even with more modern examples. Frank Lloyd Wright actually used it in the Guggenheim Museum, and it is said that many of his buildings and even the furniture that he actually produced follows the Fibonacci sequence of numbers in terms of the proportions. And he even goes beyond the golden rectangle or the golden triangle. You can see here in circles in the Guggenheim, the progression is going up and up following the Fibonacci sequence. In music, the Fibonacci sequence has also been described. Let me walk you through this. An octave on the piano has 13 notes. Eight of them are white and five of them are black. So all these numbers, I can refer to you to the right corner where I left the Fibonacci series from the spiral, all these numbers are part of the Fibonacci sequence. Now, when you compose a scale, it's usually eight notes, where the third and the fifth notes, which are both in the Fibonacci sequence, are the foundation of a chord. So again, we have numbers that belong to the Fibonacci sequence as key or very important in music. Furthermore, in a scale, the dominant note is the fifth note. Now the fifth note in the whiteboard corresponds to the eighth note if you count the white and the black, and it's contained within the 13 notes of each one of the scales. So 
the octave has all of the elements of the Fibonacci sequence and music can be composed using the elements of the golden ratio, which is not only pleasing to the eye, now it's also very pleasing to our ears. In addition, I found that uh, one of the elements of a Stradivarius violin, which reportedly is the best violin ever constructed, is actually constructed following the golden ratio. I am sure there are many other elements of a Stradivarius that make it so excellent and unique, but this is one of the key points of a Stradivarius. It always follows the golden ratio. It's probably better described in painting, and you can see Michelangelo Buonarroti, the creation of Adam, very clearly noted where he used the golden ratio. Leonardo da Vinci used it also in most, if not all, of his creations. And of course, The Last Supper has a lot of examples where he used the golden ratio. And more recently in the 19th century, The Fighting Temeraire by Turner, although all of the Turner paintings have this golden ratio. You can find it everywhere, but this is very, very clear in the fighting Temeraire. Now, in painting, the thing is that re more recently, everybody is actually telling you to do this. So in the compositions, you might actually find photographs or paintings that are very pleasing, that you find a composition is just appealing and attractive, usually has this golden ratio in mind. So it's not surprising that more modern art uses not only the golden rectangles, but you know, Dali is using a spiral in many of his compositions. And ultimately, you know, Pierre Mondrian with the golden ratio is one of the best examples of how to use it in painting in modern art. In creating these slides and this video and researching for it, I found some commentaries that the Temple of Solomon had divine proportions. There are some instructions given in cubits for some of the lengths that this temple should have. And when I looked at them, I tried to find if there's a golden ratio in any of this. What I found is that the 30 cubits that the holy place or greater house has in length and the 18.5 cubits of the holy of holies is very close to the golden ratio. So when I divided 30 by 18.5, it's 1.621, and then if we continue with the ratio, we should add 30 plus 18.5 divided by 30, and that gives us 1.616. So it's not exactly the golden ratio, but it's quite close, and I might actually have made a mistake in measuring the 30 cubits and the 18.5 cubits because those two measurements are conspicuously absent. I calculated that from these uh, renderings that have the dimensions that are provided. None of the dimensions that are provided gave me the ratios. So uh, that's why I went on and saying maybe the divine ratio is exactly related to the Holy of Holies. So it could be that my measurements are wrong and maybe it is in the golden ratio. Well, we've come to the end. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did enjoy researching for it and creating the slides and the images and animating it. It's always very nice to be able to share with all of you a little bit of you know tidbits and educational materials. If you like my video, please find other videos and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. Stay safe and stay healthy.